Varsågod. Ja, jag ser mig själv mest som ett förband i eftermiddag till det som är, tycker jag, det ni mest har kommit hit för. För att travestera ett bibelord, mig har ni ju alltid ibland er, men Emmy är bara här på en kort resa. Anders kan översätta lite det. Det var så att vi som är evangelister förut i missionskyrkan, nu är gemensam framtid, var över i London för ett par år sedan på en fortbildning som Anders hade regisserat. Och där mötte vi då bland annat Emmy i Holy Trinity Brompton. Och jag tycker att hennes erfarenhet när det gäller detta med listening prayer och vad den församlingen har betytt faktiskt för hela världen genom Alfa. Det är så värdefullt så jag vill absolut ge henne den mesta tiden idag. Och det kommer också bli en liten övning som vi gör tillsammans på slutet. Så detta blir inte bara teori. Men innan jag med glädje lämnar mikrofonen till Emmy då så ska jag bara lägga en liten enkel grund för detta med lyssnande bön. Som ju ingen av er är obekant med. Men detta kan få bli något av en återupptäckt och en nyckel till vägen vidare. Jag vet inte vad ni får för associationer när ni hör det här uttrycket listening prayer. Man kan tänka på apostlagärningarna. Hur de första visste väldigt lite om hur det väldiga uppdraget skulle utföras. Bara detta att de skulle vänta på kraften i Jerusalem. Och sen leddes det steg för steg. Och det som ledde dem var ju inte minst den lyssnande bönen. Och inte minst apostlagärningarna är ju fyllda av exempel på det. Kapitel 10. När Petrus ber i väntan på att man lagar mat till honom. Och han ser den där duken med orena, orena djur. Och förstår att Jesus inte bara dött för judarna utan för hela världen. Eller kapitel 16. När Paulus och följeslagare är ute på den andra missionsresan. Och de är lite osäkra. Och det står faktiskt att anden hindrar dem. Vid det ena området efter det andra. Tills de hör ropet från Makedonien. Kom över hit och hjälp oss. Och så ber man enskilt i små grupper, många tillsammans. Och den lyssnande bönen är det som driver det vidare. Och det var inte bara då, utan något av det kan vi också känna igen i våra egna liv. Eller tänker någon på förklaringsberget när rösten kommer från himlen. Detta är min älskade son. Lyssna till honom. Jag tänker gärna på en liten passage som Shane Claiborne har i en av sina böcker. Den som heter Bli vad du ber. Han ser ju rätt så ung ut med sina rastafläter. Men är nog lite äldre än vad han ser ut. Eftersom han var volontär en period hos Mode Teresa. Och han berättar om en sån där liten chat, ett samtal med Mode Teresa. När han frågar henne, moder, när du ber till Gud... Vad säger du då? Inte mycket, säger hon. Jag lyssnar mest. Jaha, och Gud då? Vad säger han? Inte mycket, han lyssnar mest. Jag tycker det är en underbar bön av det djupaste som finns i relationen mellan en människa och Gud. Det här gemensamma lyssnandet. Och så tänker jag att vad vi kanske föreställer oss när vi ska ställa in våglängden och lyssna. Det är att det är någonting vi ska göra. Som en lista på uppdrag ungefär. Och det är ju inte helt fel. Men det finns ett djupare lyssnande. Och jag tänker att det alltid är där det behöver börja. Och det är inte så mycket att lyssna in vad vi ska göra. Utan att lyssna in igen Guds vara. Att han är vem han är. Och att Gud älskar oss. Henry Nouwen som har betytt många, mycket för många av oss. Som citerade ett seminarium här i förmiddags. Han talar i en av sina böcker om den första rösten. Och då tänker han på när Jesus döps i Jordan. 
Och rösten kommer. Detta är min älskade son. Han är min utvalde. Och man får en känsla av att den rösten lyssnar Jesus ofta in sen. Kanske alla de där gångerna han drog sig undan. Och sen kom tillbaka med förnyad kraft och ork. Och det är nödvändigt tror jag att lyssna in den rösten. Det som är den ovillkorliga kärlekens röst. Annars är man i fara för att den andra rösten tar över. Den som mötte Jesus alldeles strax efter i öknen. Egentligen är du inget värd i dig själv. Men om du gör stenar till bröd. Om du kastar dig ner för tempelmuren. Om du gör något riktigt spektakulärt. Om du faller ner och tillber mig, då blir du någon. Då ser de andra dig. Då räknas du. Men den som är grundad i den första rösten. Jag är alltid genom bottenlöst älskad av Gud. Har ett skydd gentemot den där andra farliga rösten. Det var väl det Jesus hade. Det är därför han ständigt talar om fadern. Och till och med långt in i ett semane ber. Lilla pappa, abba fader. Om det är möjligt så låt mig slippa att tömma denna vägare. Och sen vet vi att det där ropet av övergivenhet kommer. Men han landar ändå i detta. Fader, i dina händer överlämnar jag min ande. När Henry Nouwens sista bok kom ut så var han redan död. Det var hans elever som sammanställde hans sista föreläsningsanteckningar till boken Av hela ditt hjärta. Finns på Libris bokbord här ute. Verkligen värd att ta till sig. Och där säger han att det finns en resa i mer bildlig bemärkelse som är den viktigaste som vi alla har att göra. Och det är resan till att bli den älskade. Och en del av oss har inga som helst problem med den. Det är väl självklart att jag är älskad av Gud. Och att människor också kan älska mig. Och andra av oss får kämpa med den resan hela livet. Och det gör inget. Bara vi har förstått att det är den nödvändiga resan. Att till slut det går in i botten. Jag är utan villkor- Älskad av Gud. Och vi har olika vägar tror jag. Att lyssna in den där första rösten. Den ovillkorliga kärlekens röst. Och bara sådär enkelt personligt. För mig är det inte minst skapelsen. Svårt att säga vad det är där. Men den där känslan att det blir verkligt. Inte en sparv faller till marken. Utan att fadern är med. Och det är när jag böjer knä vid altaringen. Eller står upp i en kyrka. Och någon lägger brödet i min hand. Och säger för dig utgiven. Så totalt utan min prestation. Bara ett mottagande. Men det är kanske först och sist i umgänget med den här boken. Och då är inte minst det som kallas för kontemplativ läsning att bedjande läsa att samtidigt som jag läser kommunicera med Jesus Kristus själv så att detta ordet som är för alla blir ett personligt tilltal till mig och min väg in i den lyssnande bönen handlar ju ganska mycket om detta med retrit och att hjälpa och vägleda människor där att utifrån en text Hitta den nära kontakten och att också få till sig det personliga tilltalet. Och kanske det verkar lite inåtvänt. Men då ska jag bara landa i ett enda ord som blir från över till Emmy. Och det står i Johannes första brev, kapitel 4 och vers 19 där. Och 
Och där står det. Vi älskar därför att han först älskade oss. Och för mig är det så mycket mer än ord. Det är nästan daglig erfarenhet. Att jag kan vara så trött på människor. Och att det kommer en till och önskar att jag på något sätt ska kunna förmedla någon tröst och hjälp. Men utifrån gemenskapen med fadern, det restlösa mottagandet, så återföds mirakulöst tycker jag den där kärleken gång på gång. Och jag kan älska därför att jag först är älskad. Så en enkel bön att vi här och nu ska få utgå från det lyssnandet. Herre, du vet hur vi som så ofta har uppdrag att utföra. Som vi tror är viktiga för dig. Och som många vi vill försöka älska och hjälpa. Du känner slitaget som ibland uppstår. Och du känner vårt behov att här och nu få vara de som andas in igen. Att vi på botten är älskade av dig. Och vi ber fader att det vi själva inte fullt ut kan förstå ska förmedlas till oss av dig. Så att vi kan gå vidare i lyssnande. Det är det som är din vilja. Vi ber i ditt namn. Amen. Hello. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to be with you on my first visit to Sweden. And it's so exciting to be here in Sun, although I'm sad the snow has melted. <laughs> so, thank you, Lizalette. I haven't a clue what you said, but there we are. I'm sure um, what she has said is going to complement uh, what I'm going to carry on with now, talking about listening prayer. Are any of you musicians? Not a, oh, a little hand. Um, when you tune a piano, what do you use? Oh, you don't tune a piano. Okay, good reply. Well, if you are tuning a piano, you use a tuning fork. And you hit it on the piano and it goes bing. And somehow, whoever does it knows how to then get the notes on the piano in tune with how they should be. And I think if I was to talk about how we tune in to the Holy Spirit, it would be the same. We learn to listen with our ears, but we can also learn to listen with our hearts. Listening to God encompasses many different aspects. And listening to God in our prayer times is when hopefully we are quiet, and able to have a little bit of peace without too much noise around us. But we also need to learn to listen to God when we're praying for other people. Because so often when we're praying for other people, we can impose our thoughts, our ideas, rather than what the Holy Spirit wants to speak into people's lives. And if I was to ask you this question, how well do you listen to other people? you will know your own answer. Some people are distracted. They are watching something going on elsewhere. Some people aren't really listening. They just want to give their own answer. But a real listener looks at you in the eyes, no distractions, as if you are the only person in the room, even if there are 50 other people. And that is very precious if you are the one being listened to. 
So if you're not a good listener at the moment with other people, then maybe that's a, a place to start, is say, Lord, help me to be a better listener. Now, if I was to ask you to put up your hand and say, who here feels they hear God really well? How many of your hands would go up? There you see. Thank you. I think that's most of us. I think if we're honest, most of us would say, I really don't think I hear God very well. So you're normal. Does that help? <laughs> but I want to talk firstly, before I go on to describing a little bit more about how we listen to God, about barriers that can prevent us in our lives from listening to God. And these barriers are something we need to recognize. The first is fear. I have been teaching our prayer ministry teams for many years at our church. And when we come uh, to Sunday services and people come forward to have prayer, I would say that 80 to 90% of people have issues with fear. We don't necessarily recognize how deeply rooted fear is in our own lives. We live in a culture of fear. Fear of terrorism, fear of crime, fear of disease, cancer, fear of abandonment, rejection, fear of financial difficulties, and more. And of course, the nature of fear is to deceive us. The enemy knows this, and he uses it to his full advantage. But scripture makes it very clear that the Lord wants us to be free from fear. So how do we gain this freedom from fear? Well, first of all, we need to allow the power of the Holy Spirit to uncover the presence of fear in our own life. We do that by saying, Lord, reveal to me what are the areas in my life where I am fearful? Then when we discern what those things are, we bring them to the cross. And through forgiveness, through repentance, and then through receiving God's truth, we are able to rebuke the fears and get rid of them. And then we need to allow God to encourage us and to strengthen us in our weakness, because we are all weak in this area, by his power and his presence. I think sometimes, so often, we forget as Christians that we have Emmanuel. We have God with us at all times. But so often, we're striving to do things in our own strength. And then we need to uh, make a commitment to take action, to walk in full faith and confidence in God, in his character, in his voice and in his word. For the word of God says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, that is fear, but a spirit of power, of love and of self-discipline. So part of recognizing fear in our own lives is recognizing that if we don't know and understand God's character and his words, then we will be fearful. We might actually lack um, and be fearful of a lack of intimacy with Jesus. I think all of us deep down want to have that intimacy, but we're just not sure what that's going to look like. And maybe if we are having an intimate relationship with Jesus, that our lives might be going on a different path and we're fearful of what that might look like. But what we forget to realize is that God has a much better plan for each of our lives than we think we have. Then we might have a fear of not knowing, knowing God's will or missing the call of God on our lives. And then perhaps if we do sense we we're being called, we then have a fear of inadequacy. You know, Lord, I can't do this. Gideon said that. I can't lead an army. But what happened? The Spirit of God came on Gideon 
and he became a mighty warrior. So we might feel inadequate about our lives and about a calling, but God, by his spirit, can anoint us. We might even fear the work of the Holy Spirit. We might have had a bad experience. We might have had stories from other people of bad experiences, and we say, God, I don't want you to touch me. And then what we do is we build a barrier around our hearts and our minds, and we, this barrier eventually builds out uh, or occludes God. And fear ultimately is a result of a lack of faith. In 1 John 4, verse 18, that's the verse you read, was it, Lizette? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. So that's the first thing, fear. But fear can lead to unbelief. And unbelief is another major block in every Christian. We don't believe the word of God as we should. We doubt the word. And through doubting the word, we therefore doubt the work and the character of God. Unbelief expresses these doubts in our own words and our own actions. How often when we hear someone say something, we say, oh, I don't believe that. Do you say that in, in Swedish? Oh, I don't believe that. And I think it's the same with the, it, God's word. We say, oh, I really don't believe that. But unbelief gives preeminence to our own assumptions and our own prejudices. And we are all prejudiced. There's no doubt about that. So how do we recognize unbelief? Well, unbelief, um, we recognize through this. We make up our own minds about what God can and cannot do. What he will or he won't do, how he does or he doesn't operate. And often that is because of our own experience. So if you've never heard that God has healed someone today, what will you believe? He doesn't heal. If you've never seen a miracle or heard about a miracle, you won't believe that God does miracles. If you've never prayed for someone to receive Christ, you won't really believe that God could ever use you, perhaps, to do that. So, you know, these are the things that happen. Then unbelief obstructs God's presence and power in our own lives. Unbelief hinders our prayers. Unbelief finds its own methods for accomplishing God's business, both personally and in a corporate setting, as it were. Unbelief looks inwards instead of upwards. It hinders the work of the Holy Spirit, and ultimately, it leads to you and me being in control of our own lives, which is not a good thing. So rather than seeking the Lord, and acting in faith according to his character and his promises, we depend on our own understanding, our own methods, our own strength for life and for ministry. So how do we break free? How do we break free from fear and from unbelief? Well, it's the same as with any sin. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that um, it says in the Bible 366 times, so one for every day of the year, do not fear. I've never looked up all the references, but I'm told that there are 366 references. So if we sin, we are to confess our sins. And I think sometimes the more we grow as Christians, we can forget the importance of confession and actually the importance of doing it even with one another. I have um, a prayer partner in London who's been my prayer partner for 27 years and uh, from time to time it's important that I repent, that I say sorry to God with her, but not just with her, with my small group, with my home group and people like that. And pride will keep you from wanting to say anything that will uh, admit that you are needing to humble yourself before God. But when we confess our sins, it's then important to pause and receive God's forgiveness. 
We forget the whole point of the cross was that Christ died to forgive us our sins. I was once praying with someone and um, we paused at that moment and I said to her, ask God to give you a picture of being forgiven. And after a few moments, she looked up and she said, I can see the cross, I can see Christ, but there's, there's this very, very long queue of people going all the way down the hill, and I am at the back of the queue waiting for forgiveness. So I said to her, do you think God could perhaps forgive all those people in the line at the same time? And she looked at me and she said, well, I suppose he can, because he's God. And suddenly she was at the front. She was there at the foot of the cross, receiving forgiveness herself. So in other words, she could believe for other people in front of her, but she couldn't believe for herself, and she was right at the back. But it's a beautiful thing to receive God's forgiveness. As far as the east is from the west, the word says, I remember your sins no more. So when we confess them, God forgets about them. And once we've repented of our sins and received God's forgiveness, then we need to do a little bit of action. Now, I'm not, I wasn't very good at this. I hadn't realized, a few years ago, I, I got very hurt in a personal relationship with someone on, on the staff at church. And um, I hadn't realized that my own reactions to what happened were sinful. So what I started to do was be fearful of that person and withdraw from them and withhold any form of wanting to relate to them. And uh, someone uh, very sweetly and, and, and kindly pointed out that this actually was not godly behavior. And I had never realized the importance, actually, even if someone, as it were, does something that you're on the receiving end that you've been really hurt by, that actually your own responses can become sinful. So once I had understood, I confessed those things and I repented. But then what we need to understand is that if, for instance, fear has become part of your lifestyle over many years, if I use the word stronghold, do you have that word in Swedish? Stronghold. It's like a, um, a fortress around you. How can we translate that, Anders? Stronghold. You know, if, if you're in the army and you want protection, you'll be behind a, a big barrier, won't you, to protect yourself, yeah? So a stronghold is when we build a stronghold around us to protect us. But what happens is the enemy is right in the middle of that stronghold. Because what we need to do is to rebuke the enemy. We are rebuking, because what is our fight against? Our fight is not against flesh and blood. So with this person, I wasn't fighting this person, I was fighting the spiritual dynamics that were fueling this issue. So we are rebuking the demonic beings and renouncing the lies that contradict God's truth. And uh, I hadn't realized uh, the importance of this, but if I use an analogy, if you're at home and in the middle of the night you hear the door opening downstairs or a window being smashed and you think, ah, oh, there's a burglar in the house. Do you have burglars in Sweden? Okay. Uh, you wouldn't get up and get out of bed and say, excuse me, would you mind leaving by the front door? Would you? You'd say, get out of my house! You'd be really angry. And I think sometimes when the enemy is at work in our lives, we let him walk all over us. When actually, we need to understand that we can say, be gone. We send the enemy always to the feet of Jesus because that's who deals with him. And when we do that, we're telling him basically, you're not to be a part of my life. We need to activate our wills in this. And then we use God's authority to renounce those lies that we have believed. And then after we have rebuked and renounced the lies, then we need to always replace with the truth. John 8 verse 32 says, if you hold on to my teachings, then you are my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you 
free. Who wants to live a life of freedom? We all do. So we need to replace with God's word. So for instance, if fear is an issue, uh, the scripture I read out earlier from 1 John says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. So we can speak that over our lives. And I guarantee you will see a transformation immediately. So as we walk free, I mean, there may be other things, but I've just focused in because we haven't got time on those two elements. If we walk free from fear and unbelief, then we partner much better with God and with his Holy Spirit. And when we are praying with God and praying with others, um, we do need to have a very effective partnership with the Holy Spirit. Uh, because it is through the Holy Spirit that revelation comes. And in the context of needing to hear God's voice for our own lives, but for others, we need to move in revelation more and more. John 10, verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. So if that little voice inside you says, Oh, I don't hear God very well. Replace it with the truth. Agree with the word and say, thank you, Lord, that I am one of your sheep and I do listen to your voice because you know me and I am following you. So you repeat the word back to God because when you do that, you start to believe it in your own heart and in your own mind. And to help us to listen to God, I have four points looking uh, at two verses in the book of Habakkuk. If you'd like to turn to Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 1 to 2. Now, does that sound the same in, in Swedish? Habakkuk? Yes? Good. Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And I will read this. Verse 1, chapter 2. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me, and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. So four points to learn from these verses. First point is to be still. He says here, I will stand at my watch. And stillness is not easy. Our minds are buzzing because life is busy. But have you noticed with children, if you can get them to stop rather than be running around and say, listen to me, and get their eye contact, then they hear what you have to say. They hear your instructions. And I think it's the same for us as adults. We have to learn to stop be still and learn to listen. So find a place that is your quiet place where you can be alone with God. You might have it in any room in the house, but find a good place. And learn to still your heart and your mind so you can tune in to the flow of the river of God. If at this point you think, oh, that's an impossibility because my mind's all over the place, have a notebook. And if, as a woman, you might be thinking, when I go shopping, I must buy sausages, bacon, potatoes for tonight's supper. And you, that's all you can think about. Just jot that down. And as soon as you've written it down, you can just leave it there and then focus back on God. But having a notebook to just offload things is really helpful. Then the second point is vision. Habakkuk says, keep watch to see what he is going to say to me. Now it's interesting because you'd think that it would be to hear what he's going to say to me, not see. But actually vision is a very important part of prayer. Jesus said, keep watch. In Daniel 7, verse 11, Daniel said, Then I continued to watch 
And he goes on to say, I kept looking. So we should ask for vision. Take the eyes of our hearts off ourselves to look into the spirit realm and to look in particular at Jesus. Hebrews 12 is very helpful. Verse 1 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is the one. He is the author of our faith, but he perfects our faith. So as we are looking for Jesus, remember he's present with you. He's Emmanuel, God with us. And the more you pursue intimacy with Jesus, the more you deepen that relationship with him, the more you pursue him and ask him to reveal himself to you, the more you spend time in worship and in his word, the more you will hear that voice speaking to you. And we need to practice hearing. Hebrews 5 verse 14 says, solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish between good and evil. So if we're not practicing and learning, then we aren't going to grow. And one of the ways you can do that is to look at a Bible story. For instance, Jesus with the woman at the well. And as you quieten your heart, maybe close your eyes, you might say to the Lord, um, Lord, I want to see what you're wearing. I want to sit next to you in this story. I want to picture the scene. And then you ask the Holy Spirit to help you in that process. And suddenly those Bible stories, I'm, actually I'm tingling all over as I say it, those Bible stories come alive. Have you ever been to Israel and read the word of God in the place where you're reading it. I mean, it is just awesome, but you can do that in your quiet time by being with Jesus in a story. My third point is spontaneity. This is all to do with listening. What does Jesus' voice sound like? Well, often it's spontaneous thoughts that you have that are the accurate ones straight away. Because what happens is sometimes we think, oh, that can't be God. And we try and sort of filter out through our own understanding what possibly is more likely to be God. Let me give an example. I was praying for someone, and uh, as I was praying, I just got the word or the phrase, John the Baptist. And I've learned, if you are listening to God, not just to say, strange, but to say, Lord, why are you giving me these words? And um, then when I offered them to this girl, she literally went, ah! And I said, what's wrong? She said, this morning I was with the bishop because she was going forward for selection to be ordained as a priest. And the bishop said to me, you are going to have a John the Baptist type of ministry leading many people to repentance. And do you know what her job is now? She works in a big men's prison in London as the chaplain. And she sees many people repent of their sins and come to know Jesus Christ. So if I hadn't offered that word, that would not have been a confirmation of what she'd heard that morning, and she was thrilled. Um, another uh, word I had was, do you know the nursery rhyme Humpty Dumpty? Do you have that in Sweden? Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. And I got this word uh, whilst we were praying for another girl. I thought, Lord, this is not very encouraging. <laughs> and uh, I was with a few other people, and we all offered our words that we got. And do you know what God was saying to her? He was giving her a ministry to broken people. And she now helps at our homeless shelter that we have for homeless people. So 
these spontaneous words and thoughts that come to your mind often are the ones that are absolutely spot on. And you're only offering these words. You're not saying, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> you're saying, I'm not sure if I'm hearing right, but this is what I sense God is saying. And we're supposed to weigh things anyway. We're supposed to test whether this is from God. And then my fourth point is journaling. In this passage from Habakkuk, Habakkuk says, write down the revelation. So write down what you see. The simple act of writing allows the flow to expand. Write in childlike faith. Don't test your thoughts, just keep writing. A little while ago, I was in a setting where we were learning to listen, and we were given an exercise. And the exercise was to ask God, how do you see me? Immediately, my thoughts were, oh, I won't hear God. I won't know what he thinks of me or how he sees me. But of course, I said, okay, Lord, I repent. And then, anyway, please speak to me. And my pen began to write things that I just could not believe I was writing. And it went on and on and on. Eventually, the person leading the session said, stop, time is up. And then she asked us all to read out what God had said. And I looked at what I'd written, and I thought, these words are not from me. And when I read them out, because of what God had said about me, I just cried and cried and cried. But I promise you, that all came because I didn't stop to think what I was doing. It was like God, by his spirit, took over my pen and just wrote. So it's a wonderful exercise. So, because this is only an hour and a quarter, we thought we should have a practical time. Would that be good? Ooh. <laughs> now, what I would like you to do, please, is to get into groups of three, but I want you to go and be with people that you haven't sat with. Ah, oh. people you don't know. Ah, oh. so would you first of all do that and then I'll tell you what we're gonna do. So find a three, someone, two other people you don't know. You can move all over the room where there are spare chairs. So little groups of three all over the room. So make sure you can see each other. Turn your chairs around a little bit. Not possible, they're stuck, are they? Ah, okay. We haven't really got time, ideally. Who hasn't got a three? Put up your hand if you're not yet in a three. There's two, is there any of, there's one, there you are. There's one. Okay. Right, in your groups of three, number yourselves one, two, and three. Now, now, now you have to listen carefully. You have 10 minutes for each person. So you need to keep an eye on your watch. It's just after quarter two, so the first one will be from now until just after 5-2. And what I want uh, number two and three to do is to ask the Holy Spirit how he wants to bless the person, number one. So it might be through a scripture, it might be through a prophetic word, it could be any form, but I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to bring revelation for number one, how you can bless that person. And after a few minutes, number two and three, offer to number one what you've heard. And each, as each person does that, let number one just listen. And then after you've uh, given those words, 
then number one can say, yes, I think that resonates, or no, it's not very helpful, or whatever. But I believe, <laughs> I believe it will be helpful, because I know my God. And then it's good to activate those words. So basically, if they do resonate for number one, then number two and three, bless that person by praying those words over them. All right? So you've only got 10 minutes for each person. And then after number one, then number one and three pray for number two, and then the number one and two pray for number three. So what I might do is call you to time. We might go five minutes over time. I'm sure that's okay because it goes into our coffee break. So start with quietly asking the Lord to speak to you, and then after maybe 90 seconds, start to offer to the person, number one, what you've heard. Off you go. Are there any fours? I probably ought to just keep an eye, yeah. But you can bless one another. probably ought to start offering the words you sense God has given you now.
And when you finish praying, you should move on to number two.
You should be on number three by now.
So one more minute and then we might just have a little feedback. Good. Now then, just finish this few people still just praying. It's always good to encourage one another with testimony. And I would love a few people, if they feel able, just to come to the microphone and say, yes, I have been blessed, and the reasons why. So let there be a stampede to the microphone. Who would like to be first? Are you all very shy? <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure there will be some. Here we come. Oh, thank you. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> You're going to translate. Oh, good. Yes, I need the translation. Det var alldeles fantastiskt i vår lilla grupp. Jag fick en hälsning rakt in i mitt liv, rakt in i min situation, med ord som bara Gud visste att jag brottades med. Det var fantastiskt. Oh, thank you, thank you. Halleluja, thank you Lord. Who else would like to come? This is such an encouragement when we hear that God has spoken. It's what happened for you. Does anyone want to come and be a bit more specific? Thank you. Ja, vi satt i vår grupp och tyckte att det var lite jobbigt i början och tänkte hur ska detta gå? Lite prestationsångest. Men det var märkligt. Det var inte jobbigt. Och det var så för oss alla tre att vi, vi hittade ord och vi fick hälsningar som stämde in i våra liv. Och det kan man känna sig förvånad över, men det kanske vi inte ska göra. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Here comes another lady, and then we love some men. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm do this in English. Um, yeah, I think I think the same thing. You know, for me, when we first started, and you said 10 minutes. I thought you meant for all three of us together. I was a little concerned when you said 10 minutes per person because I didn't know how we would fill that time, but it went very quickly. And I have to say, you know, in English, you use the term, you hit the nail on the head. And I think that's what, um, for me anyway, um, Pat and Maria, 
wonderfully. The Spirit th spoke through them and spoke right to my heart, so I'm thankful. Yes, thank you. Jag var rädd när vi skulle börja i gruppen. Eh, vad ska jag hitta? Och den första bild som jag får kan jag känna att jag bara blir frustrerad över mig. Jag överlämnade den. Eh, och så hände någonting. Och det jag själv fick ta emot var så märkligt. För jag fick en bild av en, en ström. En stark ström. Där båten är på väg åt fel håll och andens vind blåser. Vad jag inte berättade nu var att för två dagar sedan så svämmade du över hemma hos oss. Så jag kom inte hem till mitt hus på två dagar. Och jag hade tänkt på det som en bild på vad jag står i just nu. Jag står i en församling där jag funderar på om det är min uppgift att begrava församlingen. Där medelåldern är så hög så egentligen har vi ingen framtid. Och ändå är det den församlingen som jag känner att jag ska vara i. Och de bilder som jag fick av en stängd dörr. Om andens vind emot ström. Är bilder som jag kommer att bära med mig för att stå, fortsätta att stå kvar i den tjänst som jag står i just nu. Jag är oerhört tacksam att vi fick de här tio minuterna. Thank you. Thank you. Another gentleman, please. One more. One more gentleman. Here we come. Thank you, sir. Att vara trogen är gott, men hur länge? Jag står precis i, jag är här i Limboland. Om tre veckor börjar jag en ny tjänst. Och vad blir det då? Förväntningar från ny församling. Förväntningar på mig själv. Och Göta Petter, vad blir det av allt detta? Och då får jag hälsningen som Petrus fick. Älskar du mig? Och är det inte svårare än så så får jag bara svara ja. Och så får jag gå. Tack. Och så här enkelt är det mina vänner. Tänk om vi gjorde det oftare. Thank you very much those who came forward. And I'm sure, to, just put your hand up if you were blessed by the words you received. Now, now look around everybody. Look around. To God be the glory. Thank you, Father. So let me close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your presence with us and for speaking into our lives. Father, would you help us to grow in our understanding of how much you want to communicate to us that we might receive your blessings in our lives and also, Lord, that we might learn to hear from you so that we might bring blessings to other people's lives as well. And as we go from this seminar, Lord, may we continue to put into practice what we've learned. In Jesus' name, amen. Vi säger tack till Hemmi för detta. Och om en halvtimme, lite drygt, så, så börjar en gudstjänst här inne. En förbundsgudstjänst. Då kommer vi vara med om något helt annat sätt att, i förbunden än det här vi har varit med om nu. Det kommer bli oerhört spännande. Eller hur? Men vi behöver lite kaffebönor först. Varsågoda. Thank you, Amir.